So today I'm gonna do something just a little bit different than what I usually do. So far you've only seen videos of me out capturing images or processing the images, but what exactly is it that I personally use to capture those images? Stick with us, we're gonna review the ASI 2600 MM Pro. This is the ZWO ASI 2600 MM Pro. It is a dedicated monochrome astrophotography camera. It is massive. Just to give a sense of scale, if I hold up my Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl Champs tumbler right next to it, it makes up a large portion of it. This in conjunction with the filter wheel, the OAG, and my Explore Scientific Reducer will be as large as that coffee tumbler when I get done with this. So let's talk about this particular camera. It uses Sony's IMX571 back illuminated sensor that gives an ADC of 16-bit native. What in the world does that mean? That means this camera has no amp glow. This camera does amazing work, to say the least, and I can't wait to show you some of these examples of what my images looked like going into stacking and calibration, and then the amazing results that you will get with even low integration. You can see on the back of the camera here, and this is pretty standard with most dedicated astronomy cameras that are dedicated to long exposures. There's multiple different types of ZWO camera. For example, I have a planetary camera in the ASI224MC Pro. Now when we compare the sizes of these, it's drastically larger. So you have to make sure as well that you have a focuser that can handle this weight, as this weighs 700 grams. That's about one and a half pounds. It's actually just over. Not all stock focusers, especially when you look at something like a Newtonian telescope that has a stock focuser, can handle this amount of weight. So you do need to make sure before you purchase such a camera that your focuser can handle this weight. The key thing with the weight is realizing that a monochrome camera needs filters. And then if you're going really long distances, you're likely gonna need an OAG, and then even the possibility of a reducer. All of that in conjunction, once put together, can weigh as much as three to four pounds, depending upon your particular setup. So if we look at these two cameras side by side, the planetary camera is obviously significantly smaller. It's not even half the length of this particular camera, and it's clearly much smaller in terms of height as well. So what makes this camera, the ASI 2600, so amazing is it has a sensor diagonal of 28.3 millimeters or an image area of 23 and a half by 15.7 millimeters. It is of course a 26 megapixel camera. And we know that because if we look on the back here, we can actually see this is how ZWO names their cameras. Let me flip it around so we can see. 2600 aligns with the amount of megapixels in this particular case, which is a resolution of about 6,248 by 4,176 with a pixel size of 3.76. Now, the rest of this, these stats, I could just sit here and read them, but the big one that you need to know is, is the ADC 16 bits. What does that mean? When you look at images of this particular camera, it has significantly more shades of gray, which in turn gives a smoother and more natural contrast in transitions between different colors. And that's critical when you get to nebulas. So let's put this all together. So I've got the 2600 here, but then what? Well, we obviously need to do something. This camera natively comes with a tilt plate on the front here. I've taken that off because I'm using the OAG, which will have its own tilt plate. So there's typically a five millimeter tilt plate on here, which gives us roughly 17 and a half millimeters of total space. So you're at 17 and a half. So we take off that five millimeters, which gives us 12.5 millimeters of space right here on the deck of the camera that we're gonna remove. We're, all, we're gonna use the OAG's tilt adapter in front of the OAG 
for that extra five millimeters to get us to the illustrious 55 millimeter backspace, which is relatively close to universal for pretty much all lenses and reducers and such. So from here, we're going to mount it to our 36 millimeter unmounted filter wheel. I'm gonna go ahead and put this over here and we're gonna cover the screen just here on a soft pad. Okay, so we've cleaned out the filters. Let's go ahead and flip over the camera. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna orient it this way. We're gonna rotate it upside down and put it right here. Now I've already got my four screws. I've already got the four screws in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna align one. I'm gonna tilt this over here and that way I can get this first screw aligned. We're going to tighten it down just a little bit because I want to get the next one started as well. And then now they should all be lined up here. You want to try to do these in equal amounts, so I'm going to do a couple turns, a couple turns, a couple turns, and I'm just, I'm doing it until I feel that it gets a little snug. And then now I'm going to go little pinch little pinch and little pinch and little pinch so that now is about finger tight i can pick this whole unit up and not worry about this thing slipping that should be sufficient you do not want to over tighten these because you can strip them very easily and let's be honest zwo cameras or any camera for that matter is not cheap and i'm sure it's not cheap to replace even a front plate so now that you've got this particular portion mounted, and remember, we took off the face plate from here and that's how we can mount it directly to the red can. You won't be able to mount it to the tilt plate itself. So that's why you take the whole tilt plate off and that way you're going directly filter wheel to the red ionized camera. So now that we've done this, we're going to insert and we're gonna do this methodically. We can see we have a screw hole right here. I'm going to align this screw hole directly over that general area, and that way I know about where it's at. Now this portion, I will admit, works way better if you have a screwdriver that is magnetized. So we'll go here. And we're just gonna gently screw it back in. We're not gonna tighten it down yet. We wanna get all of the screws in. And we're just gonna go literally snug, not tight at all. And I like to feed the screw all the way down because if you drop your screw, you're risking scratching a lot of money worth of filters. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna just go clockwise. We're gonna go just a little pinch and just a little pinch, just a little. Just enough that the wheel will start to turn, but otherwise, that's all you need. You don't need to tighten these down significantly. They just need to be snug enough to hold you in place. So now that we've done that, we're gonna go ahead and put on the face of our wheel. We're going to lock this up. So now, so now again, I like to start in the most dangerous side first. This is where screws can still fall over and hit your filters. So I'm going to tighten this first. And these ones you don't need to worry about tightening in necessary, in any necessary order. You're again just going to make them snug. Just a pinch worth of tightness. You don't want to over tighten these as well. These screws can very easily strip. Just a pinch. And again, this filter wheel, this filter wheel is the seven position 36 millimeter filter wheel, or as ZWO calls it, the EFW. doing this 
smoothly and gently, Let's pinch, and our last screw here. Okay, and then I like to just kind of pull this over so I've got a filter directly front facing. It is nice if you can align your luminance first because you can actually see the sensor through your luminance. This is going to come in handy because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to mount our OAG. Now the key thing with this OAG is I've already got, and it's in focus, so that's why I didn't want to take it out, the ASI, the ZWO, ASI 174mm mini guide camera. This will do spectacular for you as it has a massive sensor. Now one problem I had with my OAG is I had a light leak. So a lot of people say they don't have light leaks. I'm going to flip this upside down and knock these screws out because I got screws sitting in there. I don't want to lose any of these. So what I did is I took a little bit of masking tape. And you can see I stretched each line to just barely touch the one next to it. And then I used an X-Acto knife and I cut out my hole and the hole for the screws. That way I've got a surface that can be flush towards the actual filter wheel here because metal on metal isn't always 100% flush. There can be even the slightest bit of deformity and if you have that and you don't properly tighten this down or accurately tighten it down, you could be having issues with a light leak and you may not know it. So I created my own. I did advise um, someone that works at ZWO that it would be amazing if they made just a real thin film like this that can actually compress under pressure. That way it just blocks out any additional light that might be penetrating through the metal. Um, I don't know if they're going to do anything about it, but I did um, voice my opinion to someone and they said they will definitely look into it. Now this isn't 100% accurate, um, but it does really well. So with this, we're going to make sure we check the prism is face outward. I already know that this is at the right height, but you are going to want to be able to see your sensor after you mount this. That way you can adjust this particular hex screw and make sure that you adjust this height to where it's just above your sensor and not taking any light from your sensor and it's just taking the spare light coming through. So keep that in mind. You want to make sure you can see your sensor. That way you can align the height of this to make sure you're only stealing light from areas that you're not actually imaging from. So we'll align this and this one's pretty important. Because this is where your tilt plate is going to be mounted, you want to make sure that you adjust this one evenly. So with that, I find it's easier. That way we don't risk scratching any filters to insert your screws now because we're only going to get them started. We're not actually going to tighten them down until they're all started. So we'll just stick them in. We'll just put them in these holes. And this is the OEGL. Do you remember the other OEG that ZWO has does not have this feature to connect. It has to be the OEGL. Okay, so we have the screws inside. You can actually see them here, one, two, three, and four. Now what we're gonna do is just slide over the camera here. And we're going to do this evenly. You are going to be using just a little hex key here. We're going to align one. We're going to just start it. We're going to align this one and we're going to just start it. Align and just, just enough that it starts, but not too tight. Okay, you can see I've got a ton of wiggle. This is where it's going to come in imperative that you just tighten it down to the point right before it starts to catch. Okay, so now that the tilt plate is on, you may have to revisit this and readjust based off of the stars, right? You may have a little tilt in this, but for the most part, because you did it fairly evenly, 
you should be fairly well off. That doesn't mean it's perfect, especially because I added the tape here. It could be off even a fractional amount, and if your light source is not hitting the sensor perfectly perpendicular, you can get your elongated stars. So here is the entire setup. As you can see, it is quite large. The next thing I'm going to do is put on my Explore Scientific Reducer. So I have the 3 inch Explore Scientific Reducer here. It's a 0.7 time reducer for, for the Explore Scientific 127 carbon fiber. It is a reducer that I use with my 127 APO triplet carbon fiber telescope. So I do put on the, M the adapter that came with my camera here, and then just line them up. And screw it in until it gets snug. Now because there is enough weight in here, I do give it just a little bit of an extra turn, just to make sure that when the weight isn't properly distributed, for example, it doesn't tilt on me or come undone because this because threads can loosen. Now you don't want to overdo it because if especially if it gets cold at night, you can actually lock the metal together um, from it contracting. So it could be very difficult to get this undone. So this is the entire thing built. It is massive. And again, I told you it would be almost as large as a coffee tumbler. And in fact, it just about is. If I line up the bottom, the tumbler isn't a whole heck of a lot larger. So what we'll do at this point is we'll go screw these threads into the moonlight focuser that I have on my telescope, and then we'll be done. All right, so now that we have this all configured, how good is it? So on my screen here, I'm going to show you what this thing can do and how it might compare to other targets. Now we have everything put together here. Now, what does this actually produce, right? Obviously photos, but every camera has different inherent, different inherent problems. But what are this cameras? So today I'm going to show you that there's really not many. Okay, so what we have here inside of PixInsight now is we have single exposures of 600 seconds for hydrogen and oxygen. Then we're going to look at the stacked data. Now this stacked data is almost within 45 minutes of my same data, but with the Eastern Veil Nebula with the ASI 1600 MM Pro. So we're going to do just a slight camera comparison in the details itself. So let's take a dive in and look. So the first thing we're gonna look at here is the oxygen. When we expand this out just a little bit, we're gonna just zoom in here and look at our noise levels. So this is an uncalibrated stack. You can see we just have the, the white pixels there and those calibrate out perfectly. So there's no real flaw with that as long as you're taking darks. I still do recommend taking darks even though you're not gonna have amp glow especially if you use AstroPixel Processor to do your stacking. And speaking with the creator of AstroPixel Processor, that is required for a proper calibration. Now he did indicate PixInsight might be getting around doing that with some other logic in place, but he did inform me it is best practice to use darks even if you don't have amp glow because it's not going to be necessary to remove some of these other little artifacts. So one area of great interest is going to be right up here towards the larger star, right? How does our data look in comparison and contrast to that? So the single exposure looks really clean. And you can see we do have a little bit of noise in here as well, which is to be expected. And most of that will start calibrating out once we start stacking these images. So now let's just take a quick look at the hydrogen layer. And let's go up to that same region just to see our details. Now remember, this is just a single exposure at 600 seconds in length. So we can see we have great amount of detail. Our stars aren't blown out. We actually have a really nice transition 
of star color into, into this hydrogen that's right here. And you can see we've got fantastic details as we move along here. So now after we minimize that, let's see what it looks like stacked, just to get an idea of how we're gonna go from a single 600, 600 second exposure into multiple hours worth. So let's start with our hydrogen alpha. Let's get it stretched. And look at this. This is really nice data here. We have wonderful gas lanes and dust. This incredibly faint gas over here. Let me pull this over and let's open up our hydrogen. And look at the difference between a single exposure. Let's get the same framing of one to one. So there we are. So look at the difference of all of this detail after we take multiple 10 minute exposures. You can see this really starts to pop and this is why you want to integrate a lot of time. You want to make sure that you're getting these faint details. I mean, it almost looks like a perfectly straight line going across here that you can see in this image of the stacked data that you cannot even see in this particular image, but it's hiding in the details once you start getting enough exposures. So there's a lot of detail that we gather over these exposures and that's again why we want to integrate. If we zoom in and we look at our noise, you can see our noise is inherently better with the stacked image because it calibrated out. Our longer exposures gave us more flexibility to have much better range here. And if I zoom in to try to get a closer one-to-one, -one, you can see the image is soothing itself out really well. So what we can do is just do a real quick noise evaluation and just see what our noise level is here. With our stacked data, it's 6.3. If we go back to our original and rerun image analysis, noise evaluation, you can see it's at 9.7. So obviously the stacked image is providing us a much better set to work with. We have way more details, we have much less noise to work with and then we can run noise exterminator or other noise reducing factors that really help smooth out this image and if we look now and compare it won't be a one for one i unfortunately don't have one for one details but let's look at the 2600 versus the 1600 mm pros okay so we have these open and they're both scaled two to one and when we look at the details, we can see clear and decisively that the 2600 on the right hand side has much smaller amounts of noise. It's not as, uh, it's not as grainy. It's not as large. If you really look, it almost looks like the data is kind of stitched together of how large these individual pixels become with regards to noise. Now, we do have a lot more pixels of noise here, but if you look, you know, these are like blobs almost, which are going to be harder to clean up. And just to prove that, let's run Noise Exterminator on both of these images. Okay, so both of these images were taken with refractor telescopes. The one with the 1600 was taken with a AstroTech 115 EDT, so it was a triplet. The right one was taken with an Explorer Scientific 127. Both were reduced, so they're very close as far as aperture and uh, focal length. Completely different cameras. Completely different cameras, and you can just see the detailed difference. Look at all these fine lines of gas and how they're truly evolving within the image itself and how we capture so much of that detail. But then when we run Noise Exterminator, we really smooth out the background and we really make the transition well between our details. But if we come over to this image, we can see that it smoothed out the background really well just because Noise Exterminator works really well. But look at the lack of detail in our image. We immediately jump from really dark grays to lighter grays. So you can see in these images, the 2600 gives us a much higher dynamic range as far as the color variations of gray. We have a real nice dark gray background that smoothly transitions into the details. And all of these 
shades of gray really smooth in and blend together well. It's a smoother transition. It gives a little higher contrast. But when we look over here on the left, you can see it's pretty quick as far as it's one shade of gray that then shoots over here. And there's really not a high contrast. There's not really a high detail um, difference in here. And you can see even if the data looks good, it just is... Uh, it just doesn't match what we can get with the 2600 as far as the level of detail, the the data that we're actually getting. We get much more defined uh, lines of gas and dust. And, I mean, you can see we, we do really well getting our information with the 1600. This is definitely not a knock on the 1600. It all boils down to budget, in my opinion. With the 1600, you can use one and a quarter inch filters, whereas with the 2600, you have to use at least a 36 millimeter um, or larger. A lot of people use two inches just to make sure they don't have any vignetting. I use unmounted 36 millimeters, and I have zero vignetting at all. But you can just see it, you know, in my opinion, the front runner is going to be the 2600. It's just. It's hard to explain what you see, but the data is just better. It's more defined. It's got a better contrast. It's smoother as far as color grading. And now that we've run noise reduction, let's see what the noise values show as now. Okay, so after we run noise reduction, we go all the way from, let's see, this is the, right here. We were at 6.3. Once we run Russell Crowman's noise exterminator, we're all the way down to 1.1, which is incredible. Let's run this now on the 1600's image. And now we can see that the 1600 is 3.5. There's a significant difference in the level of noise even after running noise exterminator, which did a fantastic job for both images. But you can see where the 2600 is really amazing. And I know with the Western Veil, I was only at zero degrees Celsius of, uh, I know my camera was only cooling zero degrees Celsius because it was just simply too hot outside. Now, I do know when I did the Eastern Veil Nebula with the 1600 Imma Pro, I was at minus 10 on paper. The 1600 should have had a lower noise amount. The fact that I cooled less with the 2600 means I could have had more thermal noise introduced, but I simply didn't. I had wonderful results. So at the end of the day, this hobby is all based on signal to noise ratio. And the fact that we have such low noise with the 2600 tells me that this camera is a winner. It is more expensive than the 1600, and the 1600 by all means can still give you wonderful results. I had multiple NASA APOD features, not winners, but I was featured on their social media accounts using the 1600 and even the 294mm, and I've had equal amounts with the 2600. So they're capable of getting recognition if that's what you're looking to do. I just like to share my photos, and if I get recognition too, wonderful. Otherwise, I'm happy if I have a low noise but a high signal photo that allows me to really bring out the essence of why we do this, and that's to make beautiful astrophotography while also capturing stuff that you simply can't touch, you can't feel it. We'll never be able to actually go visit these things. We can only image them. So um, I love sharing my results in this hobby. If you have questions or comments, please leave those in the description below. I'm going to leave you guys with that and wish you clear skies. Again, questions, comments, leave those down below. Be sure to subscribe and hit that thumbs up if you enjoyed this content. We'll be doing a lot more videos like this as well. Thank you so much.